lead to ERLC. ERLC is pleased to introduce Jim Knight with Instructional Coaching Strategies to Facilitate Successful Coaching. Um, now, J uh, Jim has asked me to go through and, and do some introductions. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll start with Annie, Annie Drapeau, because her name is right under Jim Knight's. And uh, I know where, uh, I know that Annie will be comfortable doing this or starting. And we'll just go down the list and as we do, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, tell me where you're from, um, and how many people are at your site. So if there's more than one person at your site, introduce them as well. Annie, can we start with you and I'll give you the mic. Okay, I'm sure I can start. That's what happens when the name starts with any. Um, my name is Annie Drapeau. I, um, I am from St. Albert Protestant, but I'm a seconded at the Réseau Provincial d'Adaptation Scolaire, which is the equivalent of um, the EREX that provides services for students with special needs. I'm currently um, coordinating a project where um, I am kind of learning how to be um, a coach. So, and I've been looking around, looking around beside me and my bottle of water. There's only the two of us here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Becky, go ahead, please. To speak, Becky, you just click on your microphone at the bottom left and then go ahead. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm new to the webinar experience. My name is Becky Wandio. I'm uh, at Parkland School Division. Uh, working at a forest green school, and I am a, a balance of receipt facilitator uh, full time this year for our division. And I'm very excited to be here, and I'm actually just in my office at home with me and two cats and a dog. Thanks. Great, thank you. Brenda. Thanks. Hello, and welcome from Mills Road. Brenda, how many people are there? Are there other people besides you there? I, I think yes. maybe there are. Yes, there is. Um, I'm Brenda Sumber, and I'm one of the balanced literacy coaches here at Mill Grove. And I'd like to introduce Kelly Holden, who is doing a um, math coaching uh, position, as well as Gail Reich. And we also have Ali Verge, who is also our special education teacher. Great, thank you. Denise, and I know Denise is typing uh, from Black Gold. There's Steve, Tara, Mike, Greg, and Denise, ACIC is Instructional Coaches for our district. Awesome, welcome. Gail? Gail, are you from Millgrove as well? Yes, yes I am. Great, thank you. Joel? Hi, it's Joel Kinnett from Fort McMurray Catholic, and in the room I have Patricia Namath, uh, Julie Williams, and Victor Steele, all uh, consultants uh, and, and directors in our district. Welcome, Katrin. Right. Katherine. Hi, my name is Catherine O'Grady. I'm the science consultant for Edmonton Catholic Schools, so I'm responsible for grades 1 to 12, and I coach teachers in their classrooms. So I'm really looking forward to getting some more information and tips in this process. Thanks. And Kelly, why don't you jump on the mic and say hi, even though you've been introduced. Hi there. I'm Kelly Holman, and I'm hanging out here at No Girl. Great. I think it's great that uh, so many people were able to come in teams today. So Jim, I'll give you the mic and we'll jump right in. Thanks and, and welcome Jim. We're so, um, we're so excited to have you here with us today. Uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm sitting in Lawrence, Kansas. Looking out my window, the football team is practicing, but I am a longtime Albertan. Lived there for about six years, and uh, mostly Jasper, but lived in Edmonton and Banff, and worked for Parks and Jasper, and um, 
My favorite place in the world is Mount Youth Cabell in Jasper. So it's fun to be talking to folks at the place that I really feel is kind of like my spiritual home. I love living there and I always look forward to getting back. But today what I want to do is I want to go through uh, kind of just an overview of instructional coaching. And, uh, but at the same time, I'd like to keep this as interactive as we can. So I've built in spots where it says comments on my slides. Some of you may already have the slides. I'm not sure. But don't wait until that point to ask a question. In fact, I'd ask you to say, uh, if there's something you're really concerned about or some issue, if you could just type it into the chat, and then I'll ask uh, Jan to keep an eye out to see what the questions are. And we'll pause and talk about the questions. We can either use it through chat or when we come to those points where we pause and, and discuss the questions, you could uh, come in with your microphone and ask the questions that way. Either way, if there's something you really want to ask, I'd be grateful if you post it so that I could respond. On that first slide, you can see my email. It's jimknight at mac.com. And <laughs> if we don't get a chance to answer the questions you've got right here, don't hesitate to send me an email and I'll do my best to get back to you. If it's urgent to just here right away, make sure you put in the subject line, urgent, coach about to quit, or whatever it might be, so I know that I have to respond quickly and get back to you. Otherwise, it might take me a few days to respond, but be my pleasure to respond. Now, um, I wanted to start with just a little question after I map out the content we're going to cover. Um, and the question to think about before I go through this is just I'm going to ask you to tell us, actually, you could do it now. Are you currently working as an instructional coach or a facilitator or in some kind of coachy type position? If so, just click yes, and if not, just click, click uh, the X mark, the, the, the green check mark or the, or the X. Great. Now, um, let me ask another question. H how many of you, uh, have heard me speak before. If you've heard me speak before, please put a green check mark. And if you have not heard me, put a, 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 a X. Okay. Very helpful. I like this little deal. Maybe I'll just keep asking questions the rest of the day. No, 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 I'm not going to. But um, uh, thank you. This will, if you've heard me speak before, this will be reminiscent of things you've heard before. This is a quick overview. We could easily spend two days on this, but we're actually going to spend about 45 minutes on it. But I want to talk about these four things. Why would we worry about coaching in the first place? Why would it be important? And secondly, um, why is it that it doesn't work? And I, I, what, Traditional professional development isn't that successful, and I think that's because we misunderstand how complex a helping relationship is and why coaching is essential. And then we'll do a quick review of the partnership process, uh, the, the partnership um, philosophy that underlies the way we go about doing coaching. And then I'll talk a bit about the components of coaching, what coaches do. So why do we do it? Uh, what are the complexities of helping? What's our response to those complexities? And then what are the nuts and bolts of what a coach does? We can't go into a lot of detail here, but I'm going to be back in Edmonton uh, and across the province uh, with a chance to share this in more detail. That's why if you've got specific questions, it would be my pleasure to kind of respond. So. Um, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the why question. I think first off, there's probably no one here who would say uh, with confidence that all of our students are achieving as well as we think they should. Probably each of you thinks, you know, whether you're in the classroom working with teachers or whether you're working directly with coaches, you probably all know students who you think they're not achieving as well as they could. You don't even have them in your own family. I do, that's for sure. And um, so, we want our kids to improve, and that's the, uh, probably why we focus on these things. But I wanted to share with you some research, and this is a review of the session uh, yesterday initially. Um, this comes from a study that was done in um, the state of Tennessee, and Sanders and his colleagues did this study. And what they looked at was they used what's called the teacher value-added assessment. And the teacher value-added assessment doesn't compare the sixth graders this year with last year's sixth graders. What the teacher value added assessment does is it compares the sixth graders this year with where they were in fifth grade, with where they were in fourth grade, with where they were in third grade. And you're comparing the students against themselves so you can document their, their growth. And what this teacher value added assessment method does is it allows you to see which teachers are having the biggest impact on students. In other words, which teachers 
are having students who show the most growth on that teacher value added assessment because they're with, kids are with different teachers every year. And um, what Sanders did is he went to two major districts in Tennessee and he said, what happens if you have three years with a teacher who's in the top 20% in terms of their impact on the students? And then you have another student who's in uh, three years with teachers who are in the bottom 20%. What's the difference on the state assessment scores of the student's achievement? And what Sanders found in the first system is if you had three years with a teacher who's in the bottom 20% in terms of their impact, three years in a row, that your scores would be 6% below average if you were a student who happened to be in that situation with three of those teachers. But if you were a student who had a three years in a row with a teacher who was in the top, um, the top 20%, your kids would be 46% above average. So you have a difference of over 50%, in this case 52%, on their achievement scores with everybody starting out sort of at average. In the second district, there's a similar difference of about 50%, 54%. But here, if you had three years in the bottom 20%, you would be 21% below average on the state assessment scores. And if you were in the top 20%, you would be 33% above on the state assessment scores. And so Simply put, who gets to teach you is going to make a difference of as around 50% on your, up to 50% on your scores in three years. I mean, if you were in that second system and you had three years with the teacher in the bottom 20%, you would be very far behind the chance to be achieving. Um, what the data shows, and you can look up the study if you want, you just look up Sanders and, and uh, the Tennessee Value Added Assessment. If you, uh, what the data shows to me is something we've all known. Anyone who's ever taken a university course knows the first question you ask is who's teaching the class? And how a teacher's, teacher teaches a class has a significant impact on the, on the quality of kids learning and how much kids learn. So there are lots of reasons why kids might not be where we want them to be. Uh, there's going to be problems in the community. We might, lock, might not like political moves, we might not be happy with administrators, we might not be happy about what kids put in their bodies or what they watch on TV. There's just many, many things that are going to affect people. Uh, but one thing that is sort of in our control is the way in which kids are taught. And the way in which kids are taught dramatically has an impact on how they, they learn. So of course, given all of that, what happens is that many school districts offer workshops to provide training. But the trouble with workshops is, in my opinion, they don't make much of an impact on instruction. We have a paper, it's at that website there at the bottom of the page, instructionalcoach.org backslash research, where we look at several studies that compared workshops where there was no follow-up with workshops that did involve follow-up. And what we found was that without follow-up, workshops really don't make a dent on instruction. There's a fellow named um, Marcus Buckingham. He wrote a book called Mojo. And Marcus Buckingham uh, studied more than 250,000 people who came to executive learning workshops. He followed up to see did they change as a result of the workshops. And his conclusion was that if you don't provide follow-up, nothing happens. So some kind of follow-up needs to be offered. And we focused on the follow-up that we call, we call coaching because we think with that follow-up, you can make an impact. Now the trouble is, even if you have coaches, though, the coaching might falter for any number of different reasons, but one reason might simply be that uh, the, the understanding of helping isn't where it needs to be with respect to the coaches and the leaders in the school. So I want to talk about the complexities of helping and sort of look at um, how they influence what happens. Here's my little uh, a picture of what helping looks like. Um, so the first uh, issue is that people, um, in my experience, and I'll tell you where we get this from, uh, we have videotaped uh, many teachers and coaches working together this year in a study in Beaverton, Oregon. We've watched basically every interaction the coaches had with the teachers and all the teachers' practice events, attempts in the classroom. What we found is, and this is borne out by Prochaska's research on change, is that people have absolutely no idea what they look like when they do their work. Um, I had the same experience. I recorded myself in a meeting and I could not believe what my communication skills look like compared to what I think the communication skills I would ordinarily demonstrate. And when we watch teachers 
They are blown away by what they see in the classroom. One fellow, his coach said, so what did you think when you watched the recording? And his response was, who is that man? <laughs> and that's kind of the way everybody feels. When they see themselves in a recording, they can't believe the way they, they look. And so the issue here is simply this. It's a simple truth about change is that most people have no idea how they do what they do. And that means that you could have, for example, a room full of teachers who could really need help with classroom management. And they would likely be sitting there going, well, this all sounds great, but I don't really need it because they don't know what their practice is. So the simple truth is most people don't realize that they need help, even if they need help. The second truth is around identity. And that is that people's uh, personalities and their sense of who they are is totally connected with their professional practice. When you criticize the way a person teaches, it's almost like criticizing the way a person parents. If you think of trying to talk to a friend of yours about how they parent their children, you know how cautious and tentative you'd be in that conversation. You probably wouldn't even have the conversation because you'd be afraid the person would take it personally. But I think teaching is almost as personal as as parenting, and yet we just assume we can tell people what they need to do and they're going to thank us for it. And so the second thing is that um, in, when it comes to helping people about instruction, they're going to take it personally if you give them some comments. Well, the third thing is about thinking. There's a fellow named Thomas Davenport who wrote a book called um, Thinking Fair Living, and he looked at the characteristics of a group that he calls um, knowledge workers. It's Tom, it's uh, Drucker's original uh, concept. But what, what um, a knowledge worker is, is a person who uses their imagination, their wisdom, their skills, their ability to problem solve, their brains to do their work. And I can't think of anybody who's more of a knowledge worker than a teacher standing in front of 32 kids trying to figure out how to keep those kids engaged and make sure they're learning and excited about what's happening. Anyway, Davenport said the defining characteristic of a knowledge worker is a person who means autonomy. He says, if you take away autonomy, a knowledge worker is always going to resist. If someone else does the thinking for a knowledge worker, they don't like it because what they want to do is they want to think for themselves. And so if you're in a situation where, where all the decisions are made elsewhere for the staff, there's a good chance they'll resist. So the third simple truth about helping is that people need to do the thinking. And when someone else does the thinking for them, they're going to resist. The fourth area is status. And um, Edgar Schein has a book called Helping, which is a really great little book. And he looks at the dynamics of interpersonal communication in helping relationships. And what he says is, it always involves status. If um, I'm working with you or you're working with me, and uh, one of us doesn't feel we're getting the status we deserve in this particular situation, we're going to resist. The way Shine puts it, and he quotes another author, he says that um, you can have a situation where you are the parent, or you can have it where you are an adult, or you can have it where you're a child. Whatever your age is, are you perceived as the parent, as an adult, as a child? And he says when an adult takes the role of a parent with another adult, the second adult is going to resist. The way he puts it is, if someone puts themselves one up and they put us one down, we're going to resist. And so if someone that we consider a peer to us tells us what to do, monitors us to make sure we do what we're supposed to do, treats us like children, holds us accountable, so to speak, it's going to be hard for us to accept that unless we think that person really does have much more status than we do. A peer-to-peer -peer relationship, it's going to be hard to accept a parental type conversation from somebody who's equal to us. So the simple truth about status in respect to helping is that when another person puts themselves one up and puts us one down, we're likely not going to open ourselves up to that helping relationship. The last thing is motivation. And I want to just tell a little story about this. And um, Let's imagine that there were two people. We'll call one of them Rocky and we'll call the other one T-Bone. And they're flying on a plane and Rocky uh, opens up the flight magazine, and he sees in the flight magazine that there's this really great diet. And he reads about the diet, and he thinks, man, that sounds like a good diet. I should do that diet. And then Rocky gets off the plane in his hometown, and he goes to the health food store, and he buys all the food, and he goes home to his house, and he says, that's it. I'm doing the diet. I'm in. 
And on the same plane, there's a fellow named T-Bone. And T-Bone's sitting right near Rocky. He's going to the same town. He opens up the magazine. He sees the same diet. And he looks at it and he goes, wow, that sounds like a good diet. My wife should do that. And T-Bone gets off the plane. He goes to the health food store. He comes home and he says, honey, have I got a diet for you? And he gives her the, t the diet and says, here, party on. Well, who's going to be more motivated to affect change? T-Bone's wife might be motivated, but it's probably not to implement the diet. It's probably to get back at T-Bone. But Rocky, who chose to do it, probably wants to implement it. Now, Daniel Pink has written a book called Drive. That's a nice summary of motivation. And he says that um, goals don't matter to us unless we set the goals. When it's somebody else's goal, it's really hard to get excited and motivated. There has to be something about the goal that matters to us for us to be motivated. So uh, for me, the first issue is we need to improve instruction because it's such a critical part of the person's learning. And secondly, the way we've done it traditionally has ignored many of these things and consequently uh, traditional forms of professional development haven't had the desired effect because the teachers don't recognize the need to make the change or they take it personally or they haven't had a chance to do the thinking or they feel they're being put one down by the leaders of the change, and they're often right, or because they're asked to do something that isn't a goal that matters to them. And in many ways, professional learning has ignored all of these complexities, I think, and that's why coaching is so important. So does anybody have any questions or comments regarding the first part of the session of what we've talked about? So far, we've talked about why we would do this and the complexities of helping. If you have any questions, you can just uh, put them up here on the comments page or write them into the chat and I'll we'll just wait a minute and to see if Jim, anyone I think has Joel any already popped a question in the chat. So are people aware of these things at all times? Good. Um, I mean, uh, Joel, if I understand the question, let me paraphrase, paraphrase it, make sure I've got it. Are people worried about all five of these things and the relationship? I suspect they're not worried about all of them. Different people would have different concerns, but it could easily be that all five are part of the helping relationship. Um, I mean, some people are more concerned about status than others. It might even be gender-based. Maybe some men are more concerned. Um, uh, the um, people, in my experience, it's very rare to have a person who has a pretty clear idea of what they look like when they do their practice. So I'd say the change idea pretty much applies. But I would say that it's, it's like everything else. It's a person-by-person -person situation. And for some people, some of them apply and other ones don't. Now, the question is, should we always be thinking about all these things? I think so, yes. I think that the, that the professional learning should be designed so it takes into account all these things. Catherine's got a question, was a Tennessee study done in specific subjects around overall achievement? And what they use, Catherine, is they use the, um, the state assessment scores, the very same scores they use to assess AYP. So they're, they're, I don't know the assessment, but it's a comprehensive assessment that would look at across the board, not just in one particular area. Any other questions? Okay, that's all the silence I can take. But uh, feel free to ask your questions, and uh, 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 we'll all keep watching for them. But Jan will probably catch them. That's the way it'll probably go. So, um, <coughs> how do you then deal with this helping situation? How do you? What's the simple way to deal with all those complexities of helping? Well, we say the simple way is to take the partnership approach with teachers, and um, in a nutshell, the partnership approach is that we see other people and we treat them the way we would want to be treated if someone was telling us how to do our work. In other words, if somebody's going to come and give me advice on how to be whatever it is I do and give me help on how to do it, how would I want to be treated? It's the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. And chances are that if we're being treated by other people who are helping us, there are certain things we'd want them to do. And we've articulated these as uh, seven principles. You can actually download a book uh, from the coaching website, instructionalcoach.org, uh, called the Partnership Learning Field Book, which is free. And it talks about six of these seven principles. It doesn't talk about reciprocity, but it talks about the other six. So the idea is that there are founding principles. And principles underlie everything we do. They help us as we look back. 
They help us look at the current circumstance and they help us look ahead to what we want to do. They're, they're a way of doing what we want to do. And so I'll, I'll say a fair bit about this because I think they're important for coaching and then we'll spend some time on the specifics of what coaches do. The first principle is the, is the principle of equality. And equality doesn't mean that everybody's equally talented. Obviously, Wayne Gretzky, when he was four, was probably a better hockey player than I ever was. But uh, different people have different kinds of talents. But, but, and different people have different kinds of status in organizations. But when someone who has more status than another person thinks they're better than that person, they're headed for destruction. If we think we're better than anybody else, we're in trouble. Equality means that we are equally valuable, equally important, and our words count as much as other people's words. And so when we sit down to talk with somebody, we communicate this sense that I am not better than you, I am equal to you. And this is where um, we address some of the issues that Edgar Schein talks about. The second thing is the principle of choice. And it's really hard to summarize this. It's a pretty complicated uh, concept. but it, on one hand, if there's no choice at all, you can be almost certain that people will resist. If we have a partnership, one person doesn't make the decisions for another person. And so to address the whole issues of uh, motivation and so forth, choice is critical. It's almost like a little lever. The less choice a person has, the more likely they're going to resist. But there are a number of good books about this topic of choice, but Barry Schwartz's book called The Paradox of Choices is an especially good one. And he points out that we don't want all the choices under the sun. Uh, we want some choices. And there's another book called The Art of Choosing. The author is Iyengar. And what Iyengar did is she did a little study where she set up a table in a, in a high-scale grocery store with 24 different jars of jams some days, and other days she had six jars of jams. And what she found was when she had six jars of jams, they sold way more than when they had 24. When people saw all kinds of choices, they kind of freaked out and they didn't like it. They didn't want all those choices, they just wanted some choices. So choice doesn't mean that everything's up for grabs and we're always trying to decide what we're going to do. What people want, uh, at least according to both Barry Schwartz and Sheila Iyengar, is they want freedom within form. They want a structure that allows them to feel like they have autonomy, like they have freedom. And so what that would mean is you'd establish professional learning in a system so that everybody has a voice in what happens, but ultimately you create structures that lead to change. There are certain things that are non-negotiable, but how you accomplish those non-negotiables is critical. In the coaching situation, we would give really precise explanations, but then we'd turn to the teacher and say, so what do you think about this? Do you agree with this? Do you want to change it? What are your thoughts? Uh, the third principle is the principle of voice, and it's the idea that People feel they have input into what they do, and they can say what they think. They don't have to pretend one thing and think something else. And so, for example, after a workshop, if they have the principle of voice, uh, people should say the same things in the workshop that they would in the parking lot afterwards. That's the principle of voice that people feel free to say what they think. You're talking to the real person when you talk to them about professional learning. They're not looking at you and saying one thing, but thinking something else. And then um, the language of partnership is dialogue. And lots has been written about this. But at the heart of dialogue, I think, is the notion that I go into a conversation humbly um, expecting the other person to tell me something of value. I go in hoping and expecting and believing that it's a two-way conversation. And so I'm, I'm not coming in to tell that person what they have to do. I'm coming in to meet them as a partner share my ideas, but hear their ideas in a back and forth kind of conversation. And that means I have to believe they have something in them of value, and that they have a choice to say what they think, and then it's, a, it's, it's, it's back and forth, free flowing. And a big part of dialogue is that I approach others with humility. If I come in certain I'm right, and I know what the truth is, and I just have to tell them, um, I think it's going to alienate the other people, but it's certainly not going to lead to dialogue. And central to dialogue is the idea of reflection of two people thinking together about what they, what they believe. Uh, and, and so many people refer to coaching as a thinking conversation or talk about it as two people thinking together. You, you put your ideas out there where you can see them. Rather than tell you what it is, we'll think about it together and work it through. And um, then 
all of that is manifested in a principle of what's called praxis. And really praxis at its heart is the notion that in our dialogical conversations, in our back and forth conversations, we focus on a real life implementation of this, whatever it is we're learning. There's not a lot of theoretical stuff. It's like, well, how do we do this tomorrow in our class? How can we make this work? How can we do this? And then the final principle is the principle of reciprocity. It's the idea that one person, when one person teaches, two learn. It's the old quotation. It's the idea that I go in expecting to learn. In fact, we did a study of the characteristics of effective coaches from a pool of over 2,600 coaches. And one of the defining characteristics of an effective coach was that they love to learn. They're, they're people who are learners first as they do what they do. So in combination, those principles provide sort of a theoretical framework. They're a grounding for what we do when we work with teachers. And I wanted to know if you have any questions about the comments. Joel's question is, uh, what are some phrases that illustrate these kinds of conversations? I heard a little buzz there. Is somebody going to speak up? I think, Joel, uh, it's more about the kinds of questions. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a phrase, but there's, there's sort of set questions like uh, they're usually going to be the characteristics would be they'd be open-ended questions and they would be questions that you can't get wrong. Um, there's lots of different ones, but for example, what's the most important thing we're going to talk about today? Um, uh, what I mean by an opinion question is it's a question where the other person, it's not a right or wrong question. I'm just saying, what's your perspective on this? How do you see this? And you go in really, truly expecting the other person to, to teach you something. So, for example, if we're describing a teaching practice, and it's called QD review, it's a sequence for instruction, I would say to the person, um, well, let me give you a precise explanation of this, but then you tell me what you think. Does this work for you? Do we have to modify it? I mean, researchers did it, but um, they don't know you and they don't know your classroom and one size doesn't fit all. We might need to make it work for you in a different way. So I want them to be thinking along with me as we do it. If it was in a workshop, for example, and I presented a film clip, rather than telling people this is the way you should do it, I would say, well, here's a film clip and you tell me what you think about it. It's really about letting the other person do the thinking. And now I've got a question, does this work for me? Um, oh, that's the, one of the questions I would ask. How does this work for you? What, do you? what would you do? So Joel, it's really, if I wanted to summarize it, it's really about everything I do rhetorically, if you want to put it that way, is about letting the other person be an active thinker in the process. So I don't tell them something like it's a done deal. Everything is open for discussion. That's the way I would kind of put it. Okay, I want to spend a little time on um, what the coaches do, and I want to particularly emphasize, um, these are all the components of coaching, but I particularly want to emphasize how you get people on board in the first place, and a little bit about the conversations. Um, I'm thinking at this point in the year, you're, you're wondering, well, how do I get people enrolled in coaching? So I have several little suggestions about this, and then I'll see if you have questions. The most powerful way to get people on board is through one-to-one -one conversations, I think, uh, in our experience. In fact, in the whole of professional learning, I'm convinced the one-to-one -one conversations are incredibly important. Um, the, uh, I'll give you an example of this. I went to high school in Ontario in Glenview Park Secondary School in Cambridge, Ontario. It used to be called Galt when I was there. And um, my teacher in high school was Miss Stumpf. And I was on the first grade, uh, excuse me, ninth grade football team. And Miss Stumpf was a brand new teacher. She'd never taught before. And she had most of the football team in her class. And we went in and we just did terrible things to Miss Stump. We would disturb the class. We were just terrible kids in her class. And I want you to know I've been paid back to the power of 10 for everything I ever did to Miss Stump. But anyway, one day, this is back in the 70s, I was walking home, and Miss Stump pulled up after practice, and she said, would you like a ride? And I had been mean to her in that class. I had just been snarky and not very good to her. And when I got in the car, I was in there about a minute. She was listening to the CBC. She was listening to classical music on the FM channel. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I was in the car less than a minute, and I looked at her, and I went, wow, she's a real person. And she cries, which she had done in our class. She must just feel awful. And honestly, 
it had seemed fun. This is a terrible thing as a ninth grader, but it had seemed kind of fun to get under her skin. If we could get her upset, it was kind of enjoyable. But when I saw her in that one-to-one -one experience, for only about a minute, and it was only a minute before I realized this, I was transformed, and I could never do those things to her again. And what happened there is what Martin Buber talked about, is I could, I could do the horrible things I did as a little kid because I didn't see her as real. I saw her as an object. But when I sat down one-to-one -one with her, suddenly she became real to me, and no longer could I treat her the way I did. So when you as a coach can have one-to-one -one conversations with teachers, you're going to have a better chance of moving forward because they'll stop treating you like an object. They'll see you like a real person. Because truthfully, teachers can treat professional developers the way those ninth graders treated Ms. Stump. They, they will treat them um, as if they are a job object and not a real person. But once you connect with them at one to one, they'll stop seeing you that way and they'll start to see you as real. So for me, um, there's one to one conversations are a critical way to get the, the whole coaching conversation going. So I would set up meetings in the school, go around and talk to different people, and uh, maybe just say, I'd like to get advice from you on how I can do a better job. What suggestions do you have for me? And I'd go ask a few questions, like tell me about how the year is going. Tell me about the strengths and weaknesses of your children. Um, tell me about uh, what roadblocks you're, you're experiencing, what have been your successes. And mostly just get there and listen. And during the listening, I will explain what I can do. Here are the things I have to offer. And I hopefully will be able to find some kind of connection with them where they can, I can say I've got something that might help you with the fact that your kid's writing is disorganized. That's the whole one-to-one -one conversation piece. To do that, I would say it's helpful to have a one-page summary of everything you can do as a coach so you can leave it with the teachers, but uh, just to get the ball rolling. Now, sometimes as a coach, you will give sl a large or small group uh, presentations. And all I would say about that is keep it short. Don't talk for more than 30 minutes and give them some kind of form to let you know right there in the workshop if they want to work with you. If you give them a form, 25 to 75 percent of the people in the room will let you know they'd like to get together and talk to with you about something. But if you say email me if you're interested, maybe one person will email and he or she is probably related to you. Not many people will email you. But when you when you give them the form right there, we've seen somewhere like 25 to 75 percent of the people will let you know right away that they want to do it. And you can download a sample form on the coaching website in the tools section. Now, principal referral can be one of the best ways to uh, enroll people in coaching, and it can be the kiss of death. If the principal says to a teacher, you're not doing well enough, you have to work with the coach. Then the teacher goes to see the uh, the coach, teacher goes to see the coach and says, okay, Wilson says I've got to work with you, so fix me. you got 15 minutes. What happens there is the teacher sees the coach as a punishment. But if the coach says, or the, or excuse me, the principal says to the teacher, look, I did an assessment. Uh, you've got 65% engagement. We're committed to getting to 90%. That's a non-negotiable. You and I are going to work together to make sure you get to 90% engagement. And there are lots of ways you can do it. I can recommend a book. I can recommend a video series. There's some websites you can go to. There's some other people you can talk to about this. But you might want to work with the coach. She's a pro at this. She's really, really helpful with respect to engaging instruction. And so you may want to work to her. How you do it is up to you. But what you can't do is you can't keep having 65% engagement. We've got to get to 90%. Well, in that circumstance, and this is a good example of freedom within form, in that circumstance, the structure is, the non-negotiable is, we have to get to 90%, and the teacher has the freedom to do whatever they want to do to get there. But in most cases, they'll say, man, the coach sounds like the easy way to get there. Then they go to the coach and say, look, Wilson wants me to work on this. I don't really know what it is. Can you help me? And instead of being a punishment, the teacher becomes a lifeline. They help them do it. Now, the last idea is that there's going to be workshops during the school year. There's going to be teams. And at the end of any workshop, I think there should be time for teachers to say, how can your coach help you implement this? People won't implement without follow-up. And so I don't think there should be a workshop without time built in where the teachers are able to say, I want to work with the coach on these kinds of things and to plan out exactly how the coach is going to support them, whether we're talking about professional learning communities or teams or whatever learning is taking place, workshops, it should end with uh, some kind of opportunity for, um, for people to, to plan to work with the coach to get it implemented.
And these things are not a one-time thing. You're kind of doing all of this all the time to enroll people in coaching, part of it being that the principal's powerfully behind this and supportive. Does anybody, does anybody have questions about the enrolling process? I've never done wait time talking to a computer before, but I think that was good. So I'm going to move on. Um, the next thing is to identify what, what happens. And I'll just say a few things about this. For us, the piece of technology that's become essential for us as coaches is uh, 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 the use of a flip camera. And this is a sample flip camera. Many of you have them that cost about $200. They're essential because of what Prochaska uh, said in his book called uh, Changing for Good. And Prochaska says, um, quoting G.K. Chesterton, it isn't that they can't see the solution, it's that they can't see the problem. And in many, many cases, what we found is uh, people really have no idea what their practice is until you show them a video. But when you show them a video of their class, they do want to make a change almost immediately. One teacher we worked with said, I watched the clips. I was so upset at how bored my kids were. I stayed up to 1 o'clock rewriting all my lesson plans as soon as I saw the lesson. And it's dramatic and it's powerful. And honestly, it's a little painful to watch. But what you're doing is confronting reality. And once you confront reality, you can do something about it. Now, our goal is to have the teachers get a clear picture of reality by videotaping the class and having them watch the, the, the videotape, the video record, and we'll have them watch the tape. And then we want to sit down with the teachers and identify where's the leverage, what's something we can do that's not too hard to do that can have a really big impact. And most of those tools you can find on the big four uh, Ning, and they're focused on these four areas. Planning your content, that's curriculum. Weaving an assessment for learning into your class. A number of different instructional practices you could use for differentiation, like effective questions, stories, cooperative learning, using thinking devices, challenging assignments, experiential learning. And then classroom management techniques, like being really clear on your expectations, um, reinforcing kids with more praise and corrections, uh, being fluent with your corrections if you have to give them, and just uh, working on community building. Those are, the, for us, the four areas. And our little analogy is it's like a journey. Content planning tells us where we're going. Assessment for learning is our GPS, tells us where we are. Instruction is the fuel. And community building removes the friction and makes for a smooth ride. And, uh, and the tools uh, that are underneath these, you can download from the Big Four Ning, which is a free uh, Ning where you can download the manuals for all those areas. And our coaches generally focus on most of those things, curriculum planning, community building, and so forth. And they're free, and you can photocopy them. And if you go to that Ning and you go on the left-hand side, uh, you can download all the manuals in PDF file format. So let's just say that the teacher has watched the tape, and I've talked to the teacher about what she's done, then she and I, or he and I, get together and we set a goal. And we want a goal that really matters to the teacher. Jim Collins says you want a goal that hits you in the gut. That is, we're focused on something, and in most cases, it's a student goal, a difference we'd like to see in our students. And the teacher and I identify a goal that matters to them after they've watched the video. And then we work to try to do what we can to hit that goal to make the target go. And that involves explaining, uh, explaining a, the practice. Um, just to say two things about the way we do explanations. One of them is you have to be very precise. And I really like um, this uh, idea of using a okay, skipped one here. No, uh, I really like uh, the idea of a precise checklist that uh, explain exactly what the practice is going to look like. This is how, for example, if we're using a graphic organizer, we might teach how to use the graphic organizer. We cue the kids to let them know we're going to use a graphic organizer, and then we walk through the organizer in an interactive way and shape responses, and then we review to make sure kids know what they've learned and know how the graphic organizer works. It's cue to review. It's a little ritual for the class. So during the explanation phase of the precise tool we're using, I would give real precise explanations to the, to the teacher, but I would make them provisional. I would say, okay, this is what research says, but what do you think? Do you want to modify this? Is this the way you'd like it to be? I hate to tell you this, but I'm having this vision of you all just zoning out there at the end of the day in your rooms, but uh, 
I'm going to let that vision go because it's kind of freaking me out, and I'll stick with my, my discussion. At any rate, um, the idea is during the explaining phase, you have to be very, very precise, but you have to be very, very provisional. And so I give a really precise explanation, and I leave room for the teachers to think about it. And in my experience, often when coaches are explaining whatever this new teaching practice might be, their explanations aren't nearly as precise as they should be. Um, and if you aren't precise, Atul Gawande talked about this in his really great book called The Checklist Manifesto. If you aren't precise, often the reason why people don't implement isn't because they don't want to do it, they just don't know how to do it. Well, after we've uh, enrolled a teacher, after we've identified what to do, we sit down and explain it, and then we mediate, which means we work with the teacher to make this work in their classroom. We modify things and we adjust them. So they've got, let's say it's a graphic organizer, the teacher and I would create the graphic organizer together. And then I say to the teacher, do you want me to model this practice? Do you want me to come in and show you what it looks like? And in our experience, I interviewed uh, 13 first year or second year teachers about their work with a coach. And what they told me, and this has been borne out over time, is that the most important thing for them was watching the teacher do it in their classroom. They said it wasn't until she did it in my classroom with my kids that I realized I could do it too. So for us, modeling the practice is critical. Now the modeling is only going to be something a teacher wants if they've done all the preliminary stuff. If you walk down the hall and grab a teacher and say, hey, you want me to come in and model best practices in your class? She's not going to be too hot about that. She'll probably say, oh, everything's cool. No, it's all right. But if you're teaching a teacher how to use uh, thinking prompts or a cooperative learning te technique, the teacher will probably want to see it first before she implements it. So if the teachers don't want you to model, there's a good chance they're not really thinking about implementing. It's modeling that makes it happen. And you don't have to model the whole 90 minutes or 75 minutes or 42 minutes of the class. You just show them how to do the thing itself, and then, then you move on. And what you move on to is observing the class. And now what we do, whenever possible, is we video record the class with a flip camera. And then we share the video with the teacher, and we ask her to look at things that she liked, and we'll look at things that we liked. And we come back together, and we have a conversation about what happened in the tape. And usually, when we do it like that, we ask a few questions like how close is this class to uh, where you'd like it to be? Um, how would you feel if nothing changed in your class? Uh, what changes do we need to make to get it to a 10 if you think you're only at 5 right now? We have sort of open-ended general questions we ask. And um, we explore with the teachers what happens on the tape. And we like the idea of them picking, watching the tape first, and I watch the tape, then we come together. And then we pick a few clips to watch, and, and we try to set it up that it's not me telling the teacher, it's the two of us engaged in dialogue looking at the, the data. And in this, this case, the data is what's on the tape. And so those things are really how we do coaching. Uh, we just keep it going by doing explaining or modeling or observing until the teacher is fluent in learning the practice. If you've ever been an athletic coach, you coach hockey or whatever it might be, you know that the defining characteristic of a good coach is somebody who breaks down the steps so the kids can learn how to do it. And they say, let me show you how to do the first one. Now I'll watch you. OK, you've got that. Let's move on to the second part. Uh, you watch me. I'll watch you until it's fluent. And in that sense, what instructional coaches do is quite similar, although they do it from the perspective of partnership, which means they have teachers really thinking about what they think about the practice. So those are the, the ideas of the components of coaching. You enroll people uh, through the various ways I mentioned. You identify, ideally by video recording the class, although the teacher might already know what they want to work on. You explain the practice. Then you make that practice fit the teacher's classroom. You shape it to fit their needs. You offer to model. You observe. And then you sit down and talk about, OK, what did I see? And then you go back and sometimes you explain more, or sometimes you model more, or sometimes you observe more. If it's classroom management, it's probably observation. If it's a planning routine, you probably spend most of your time explaining. If it's a, a complex reading strategy, like say um, reciprocal teaching, it might involve a lot of modeling. But you keep going until the teacher is fluent in their practices, until they've, they've implemented what they have to implement. So I'm wondering if uh, 
you have any questions or comments about all those things we've looked at with respect to coaching. This is, in a nutshell, um, a quick overview of how we go about doing instructional coaching. You could uh, put questions on the comment board using graffiti, or you could send chat, or you could turn on your microphone, whatever you feel like doing. Annie said she was going to check her home fridge to see what she's got there to drink, so maybe she she's done that. I know the wait time is tricky, Jim, but I can see that Catherine's typing something, so uh, we'll give her a minute to put that up. Okay, how about permission for recording? Um, I think that's a district by district question, but um, what happens is uh, uh, in, in our experience, if we record the teacher and we just share the recording with the teacher, then we're able to record whatever we like. We were in the classroom, the teacher was in the classroom, so were the students. We can't um, record the class and then put it on the web or use it in a presentation or share it with anybody else, but if it's just used for the professional learning of the teachers, then we're off to the races. But I don't want to double check uh, board by board or district by district criteria, but um, that's, uh, that's really a, uh, not an issue for us if, the, um, if it's not going beyond the coaching conversation. We've never really had any concerns. Then in our research studies, we have people sign um, consent forms because we know the study, the video is going to go beyond the two of us. But so long as it's between the two of us, it's really not an issue. There was another question about the, the, the next session. And it says, are we going to do coaching strategies in our next session? And we'll know, when you say coaching strategies, do you mean how we go about doing question coaching, or how we do modeling, how we do observation, how we do feedback, or do you mean the teaching practices okay, we yeah. share, well, like uh, more in what coaching looks like from the perspective I think over the so in other session, words, we're going to do, do both. With Catherine. teachers in their classrooms in order to make their practice better? Because I can understand it theoretically, but I'd like to know more about the, uh, you know, the process of Well, it's my intention to, to just give us a quick overview of the process itself, but next time we're together, we'll look at video of coaches working together with teachers. We'll see little snippets of uh, everything they do, but I also want you to email me the questions you'd like to see. So if there's, uh, I mean, when we're together face-to-face, -face, we will look at a uh, video of the teachers working. Um, but if there's a question you want to make sure I address in one of these sessions, just let me know. There's like uh, now something like 31 days of different workshops we do at the University of Kansas. So there are a lot of things we could talk about. At this point, I'm planning on looking at watching when we get together face to face, looking at video of the coaches and teachers talking together and sort of see the process all mapped out. Yes, that's exactly what I'm hoping for. Is that what you're hoping, Catherine? Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. So while well, we you, have you, time, are there any know. other questions <laughs> or suggestions for things that you're particularly looking for in that in-person day on October 28th? Maybe I have something. Um, am I being heard? Okay, good. Um, what I wanted to know is that uh, you're talking about referral to the principal, and I know from having gone to different things, we have to be careful in gaining the trust of the teacher and not being there to cure the teacher because that's what the principal wants us to do. So how do we balance between what we do with the teacher in the classroom and what the principal wants to know what's happening? Okay, um, boy, there's, there's a lot packed in that question, Annie. It's a great question. Uh, f first off, um, uh, what I talked about yesterday with the principals was how the whole system has to be um, 
focused on a few key things. You can't change every year, and this year we're doing understanding by design, and next year we're going to do formative assessment, and we're going to do differentiated instruction, but we're going to follow a pacing guide. I mean, it, it can't be changing all the time. There has to be a focus on a few key things. And, uh, and the teachers have to be involved in the development of that, what I call a target, that, that describes those few key things. And professional learning supports it. And uh, if we're, and the principals know our leaders in it. They're experts in those practices. They're the lead learners. They even lead the workshop sometimes. And so there's a real sense that we, we, we know where we're trying to get to, and all our professional learning supports it. So we don't have one way of evaluating teachers, another way of uh, coaching, and another way of, and then our workshops are on something else, and it looks like it was just picked this week. It all is focused on a few key things. So the first thing is there's a, a genuine commitment to try to get to a destination that's articulated in a, in a simple document, not a 70-page school improvement plan, but like a one-page document of here's where we want to get. Then I think embedded in your question was about the issue of confidentiality. What should a teacher share with the, with the principal or coach share with the principal? And it's hard for me to give you a quick answer, but I will talk about it later. But just to cut to the chase, I'd say, first off, if it's not confidential, it's going to be a hard thing for the teacher to embrace. I had a coach, and the coach helped me with time management. And my comments with the coach would have been modified if I knew the coach was going to go back and talk to my boss. I was talking about time management. It got into an honest appraisal of how I used my time and how I wasted time. And if I knew the way I was that my conversation was going to go back to my boss, I wouldn't have been as candid, and I wouldn't have learned as much, and I might not even have wanted to do it. So I think you want to, you want to bear in mind that the less confidential the conversation is, the more likely the person will resist. So where we draw the line is we say we will talk about who we work with and what we do, but we won't offer any kind of evaluative comments, not even like how do you think they're doing. It's the administrative team's job to observe we just provide, my technical term is, freaking awesome support. We go in and we do all we can to make it happen. Now, if by chance the, there isn't clarity between the principal and the coach on this, one of the first things you have to do is sit down and have a conversation about where the, draw, the line will be drawn. Because what will really get you in trouble is if you say one thing to the teachers and you do something else with the principal. If you tell me this is confidential, it better be confidential. So I would rather have a situation where I tell the teachers, anything you tell me, I might take back to the principal and be honest about it than to say it's confidential and not have it be confidential. Because because if you breach the teacher's trust, they will know it and they won't want to work with you and it'll significantly damage your relationship. Okay, my clock says 6.05. These are, these are trooper, troopers. I know it's 5.05 there, but you know. Any last questions? Thanks, Jim. Well, I just really want to thank you on behalf of all of our participants Jan, and ERLC. Um, this has just been an excellent discussion, and uh, I think that your presentation was so clear that at this point of the overview, there aren't a lot of questions, but that last section, that um, that clarification you gave around relationships was really great. and. Um, I think, too, I just wanted to comment that all of the characteristics as you were presenting, the characteristics there, I was thinking that that really needed to be authentic. So it's not just lip service to those characteristics, but it actually has to be authentic in developing those relationships with between the, you know, the people that you're coaching and the coach. So um, thanks again, Jim. We will be meeting face-to-face. October 28th at the Fantasyland Hotel. And as Jim said, if you have any comments or specific things that you would like to talk about or discuss during that day, please do email either Jim or myself. Um, as you leave today, an evaluation survey will pop up. It's just a very short survey, not a full survey, but just to give us some feedback for the next session. So if you would take two minutes to fill it out, we'd so greatly appreciate it. Other than that, thanks everybody and have a great night.